Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the HPO podcast. I am your host, Zach Bitter, and today I am joined by Alex Wish. Alex is a diverse guy. He has participated in a wide range of sports, including sailing, wrestling, mixed martial arts, and ultramarathon. He recently challenged himself by putting together a project where he strapped on a 20-pound weighted vest and completed what he has labeled the 6,000 challenge. This included doing 1,000 pull-ups, 2,000 push-ups, and 3,000 squats. Alex has struggled with depression, and he has found exercise in challenging himself physically as an important piece to his puzzle in the management of his depression. We spent a good portion of the interview discussing how he has structured his training, how his depression impacts his drive to train and compete, and how he has worked with others in developing winning strategies to help them in many areas of life, including business, athletics, and much more. Alex also shares with me what is next on his calendar of big challenges and the areas he is finding the most challenging to prepare for. Before we get rolling, I will mention Alex referred to a workout style called EMOM, E-M-O-M, a few times during the interview. For those not familiar, EMOM is an acronym for every minute on the minute, which typically is structured in a manner where you are asked to complete a certain number of movements like push-ups, pull-ups, burpees, or whatever, each minute for a designated amount of time. So you would begin at the start of each minute and you have a break for however much time is remaining in the specific minute before starting the next one once you finish the completed list of tasks. Uh, So for example, if it takes you 40 seconds to complete, you would have 20 seconds of rest before starting it all over again. If you enjoy this podcast and wish to support either monetarily or by sharing, liking, and subscribing, please head over to zackbitter.com forward slash HPO for options, which include joining my Patreon page, making a quick one-time donation, which includes options to avoid the need of joining a third-party platform, or subscribing to HPO on your favorite podcast listening or viewing platform. You could also support HPO through the show sponsors. Details on all discounts and promotions from HPO show sponsors can be found at zackbetter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. That link is in the show notes. For this episode, my friends at Element are sharing some of their goodness to HPO listeners with some free product for the cost of shipping. Element makes an electrolyte supplement with no sugar. Each packet is loaded with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. They come in convenient single-serve packets that make them great for bringing along for a run, hike, to the gym, or while traveling. Personally, I like to use a single packet with about 2 liters of fluid. Their flavors range from citrus, raspberry, orange, watermelon, chocolate, mango chili, lemon, habanero, and plain. Those last three work great as add-ons with food and when I'm going out to eat or traveling. I love adding the chocolate flavor to my morning coffee before I head out for a run and then mixing in some watermelon version to my post-workout water bottle. For $5 shipping, you can get an 8-flavor sample pack for free and see what you think. If you want to check them out and support HPO along the way, you can head over to drink, capital L-M-N-T, dot com forward slash HPO. Links can be found in the show notes and at zackbitter.com forward slash sponsors. Also sponsoring this episode is Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker was founded in 2009 by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics. Using their patented algorithm, Inside Tracker analyzes your body's data to provide you with a clear picture of what's going on inside you and to offer you science backed recommendations for positive diet and lifestyle changes. Then, Inside Tracker tracks your progress every day, every step of the way toward reaching your performance goals and living a longer, healthier life. For a limited time offer, Human Performance Outliers listeners can get 25% off the entire Inside Tracker store. I recommend checking out one of their blood plant panels. This can allow you to optimize any nutrient deficiency in a targeted way. Just visit InsideTracker.com and enter the offer code. H-P-O-P-R-O-25, that's H-P-O-P-R-O-25. 
you can find those links and promo codes in the show notes and at zackbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Also, if you happen to be a coach, trainer, registered dietitian, or other health and wellness practitioner, your gateway to offering your clients Inside Tracker is Inside Tracker Pro. You can find more details about how to be onboarded into that program at insidetracker.com forward slash HPO. All right, folks, welcome back to the HPO podcast. Uh, today I am joined by Alex Wish. And Alex, uh, you are going to be a guest I think a lot of my listeners are going to be a fan of based on just your vast array of different physical achievements. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah, it was it was interesting because when I when I first uh, caught wind of you, it was uh, it, it had like 6,000 on. I'm like, oh, 6,000. I wonder what this is of. And and then I dove into it a little bit and it turned out it was 6,000 added up where you did a thousand pull-ups, 2000 push-ups, and 3000 squats. And you did it with a 20 pound vest on. Yeah, it was, um, yeah. So the 20 pound vest slash that day was pouring rain. So that 20 pound vest definitely started to get a little heavier than 20 pounds. Oh gosh. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Water is heavy, especially when it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when it can stick, stick with you. Uh, anyone who's ran, ran through puddles and let their, their running shoes get soaked hell, can, can attest to that. I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, what was, uh, kind of the idea behind that? Was that something that you came up with or was there some precedent with that type of an activity before? Yeah. So the idea originated, well, so during the pandemic, I've always been, well, prior to the pandemic, I've always been an athlete. I've, I've competed professionally in several racing. I've done ultra events with obstacle course racing. I did MMA. I did wrestling. I've done a lot of different events. Um, and when the pandemic hit, there was nothing to compete. And for me, like, you know, I struggle with, I have struggled and I still struggle with challenges of major depression and I need something kind of mentally to focus on a goal an outcome. Um, and with no events like going about, I basically created my own event and I wanted to also have a way to inspire other people and motivate other people during a time where it's really challenging. Um, so I thought of like, okay, what, you know, what's really ambitious, something that I may or may not be able to accomplish. And I was like, well, maybe I'll start off and like, I'll do the Murph times 10. That was like the original idea. Um, and, you know, I came up to the, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set the date. I'm going to have it be the day before Memorial's day, uh, mental health awareness month, also like mental health awareness for veterans. Um, and then along with that, it, well, actually two days, once I decided I was going to do the event, I actually tore my adductors, my lower abdominal muscle, um, which kind of set me back. So the running piece I took out, which I'm really glad I did, because I think that would have been kind of just a little more challenge than I needed. Um, yeah. So then it turned into doing a thousand pull-ups, 2000 push-ups, 3000 squats uh, with a 20 pound vest. And, um, and I did it in kind of like an imam style and broke it up, but yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, a cool activity that obviously you're going to push the limits and it's got like this component of endurance in there just from the amount of time it must've taken you to do that, but also obviously the strength component. So I am kind of curious about how you prepare for something like this, because when I think of, you know, people, people follow me like, Oh, well, he's running an ultra marathon. This is how fast you run it. You must just do a lot of running at that pace. And then when you kind of get into the weeds a little bit more, you realize, okay, there's actually like a periodized process here. Is there any kind of structure that you follow to prepare for this? Or were you leaning a lot on kind of, I mean, you had, you had a pretty extensive like athletic background before this. So you may have had a lot of kind of tools in the toolbox, toolbox so to speak already, but what was kind of the, the planning process from a training standpoint like? Yeah. I mean, so for me, I mean, there were some things going into it that I was worried about. Um, one is, you know, thinking about it, like if you work out too hard, you do something that's too intense, you can have too much muscle breakdown and that can actually affect your kidneys and you can have like, you know, kidney failure. So, you know, I was thinking about that for me, one of my strengths as an athlete is that I've always been able to train extremely hard and I've never hit a point where I put myself in medical danger. Um, so that's like a really big strength of mine going into this, the training piece was really tricky. Um, I think like I went into it with some ideas, but as things developed, I definitely learned very quickly of what not to do and then kind of really learned of what to do. 
um, it had a very like endurance aspect, but a high intensity aspect. I mean, it was considered, it was pretty much like hit training consistently for six hours and eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a lot of my training sessions, I would go into some lifting sessions. Like I kind of broke up my lifting, my week into lower body pulling and pushing, um, my base trying to get stronger. And then I would also do a lot with the assault bike. So I would basically do uh, about 30 seconds of as many pushups as I could 30 seconds of assault bike. And I would do like workouts like that for, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And then I'd kind of figure out how many pushups I could do consistently every minute when I kind of put it in that style, I do the same things with pull-ups squats. Um, but I did a lot of workouts with that EMOM style and kind of kept bringing that time greater and greater. And one thing I watched out for though, was definitely that balance between how much volume can I get in without putting myself in too big a recovery hole? Because if I like train too much that I'm out four days, like that's not helpful. So there's definitely times that happened too, but it was a overall very big learning period. Yeah, that's such a great point. And it's a topic I've been kind of diving in a little bit more into recently, just to kind of, I guess, help educate folks who are following me or who are interested in just like proper training. Obviously, for me, it's a little more exclusive to running, but there's this, uh, this, this idea or this thought, I think, where people get really excited with their end goal. So for you, this, uh, this 6000 challenge was your, your kind of end goal. And I can just imagine the things going through someone's mind preparing for something like that could be like, okay, I need to do as much as I can, as quick as I can. And this is a common mistake I see in the endurance running yeah. world too, where people jump into something full bore and they'll be like, well, my friend's running this, I'm going to run with them, or this is what I need to do. And it's like, okay, I get that you want to be there right now, but if you, I like to call it macro stressing and micro stressing, if you macro stress on one day and that takes three future training days off the table, you have to ask yourself, what would your total volume, uh, what were your, or what would your total workload look like if we just peeled back a little bit and you introduce it like that? So is that kind of the mindset that you had going into that as well, where you have to be kind of looking at the big picture as well as the individual workout? Oh yeah. I mean, there was definitely a big picture to look at because, um, I mean, one person I, ha I have talked to this friend of mine is Hunter McIntyre. He trained for the fastest Murph possible. And part of his training, what he learned is like, you know, he hit his goal. I think it was under 30 minutes, but when he actually came to actually timing himself, um, he wasn't at his peak condition because like, it was like a week and a half, two weeks earlier, he went too hard and didn't recover enough time for that actual event. So there was like definitely a big taper process I had towards my event. Um, and the breakdown too, if I looked at it, like I literally trained like my pushing twice a week, my pulling twice a week, my lower body twice a week. And it was fairly intense, but I gave myself like a two day stretch and sometimes a three day stretch in between to really recover when I went back to the upper body or to the lower body. And then, well, there was a lot of constant, um, cardio in between. Interesting. So what I want to dive a little bit into kind of the exact type of workouts you were doing with like the pushing sure. and pulling type activities, the, the way I imagine some of this is obviously event itself it's body weight plus 20 pounds in those movements. And I would imagine you get maybe a little more specific towards that as you're getting closer to the event, but were you doing like bigger, uh, or I should say more like higher, uh, weight, lower repetition type movements within that as well earlier on, is that kind of the process with that? We are going kind of least specific to most specific, or am I off base with, with your activities? No. So, I mean, I did it a little differently and I mean, honestly, there might've been a better way to do this. Um, when I went into it, so like on my day that I was kind of matching up either the armorgometer or like I did the assault bike and I kind of break up that EMOM style of 30 seconds of the push-ups or pull-ups or squats, and then the assault bike or some other type of cardio. Um, right before that, I would do a pretty heavy lifting session. My idea kind of going into that on a psychological frontier was kind of, okay, I'm going to be doing this EMOM for six hours or longer. I may get myself originally 10 hours. I didn't know how long it was actually going to take me because things can change throughout, you know, a competition. You, you don't even expect things to come up. Um, so I went in to do some pretty heavy lifting, uh, before I did the EMOM to kind of really put some additional stress on my muscles. 
And then after that heavy lifting is when I went into that EMOM. So I'd have that fatigue, but most of that stuff was done with the, the 20 pound vest. Um, pretty much when, when I did the actual EMOM styles, but before, like I did do weighted pull-ups, you know, and I, I did do things with the bench press. It's probably the first of my life where I've done the most bench presses ever. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of core work too. I mean, I, there was a lot, a lot of core work put in because, um, you know, even if you're doing pull-ups, squats, or push-ups, being in like a plank that long, or, you know, keeping your body rigid in good form, um, core is very important. So it was definitely a combination. Yeah. Your, your core was probably engaged. Well, it had to have been engaged that entire time. So having that kind of as your a foundational strong point, I would imagine would keep the, the end phase of that event a little more, a little more, like you said, good form, but also just uh, ability to kind of get through it, I would imagine. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think, um, you know, core can sometimes be overlooked in different sports, but it's really the fundamental. I mean, it's connecting all the pieces and if your core gives out, you know, if your if your abdominal muscles get fatigued, your lower back gets fatigued, you're also more prone to injury. So, you know, one other big part about this, um, I'll kind of mention is going into it. I also had this idea like, Oh, maybe I want to get really light, right? Because the vest weighs a lot you know, I'm already weighed decent amount as I am. So if I'm lighter, you know, I'm going to do better. Um, I was able to work with a woman named Nancy Clark, really good sports nutritionist. And we kind of came to a conclusion where I want to be more bulletproof than necessarily focus on being lighter. So, you know, when I did the competition, like I'm about five, five, eight and three fourths. So we'll, we'll just call it five, nine. And, you know, I weighed about, um, let's say times doing the competition about 189 which was pretty heavy. And then you add the, the vest on. Um, but I kind of took the focus away from losing weight and just focused on eating food, you know, staying around 12% body fat. I just found myself really being strong and less likely to get injured. Um, and kind of kept that in mind as I was training for the event too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine finding some of the stuff or the answers to some of these questions. And like you said, maybe you, you didn't necessarily find them all uh, it would be difficult because there's not a lot of precedent for something like this. I think uh, like when I look at just going into a race for myself, uh, there's precedent both from other folks doing things like it as well as what I've done. So I kind of have a little bit of an idea as to like, oh, I tend to feel best or my power weight ratio tends to be best at this spot. Whereas you're kind of yeah. learning on the fly a little bit, which I'm sure added to the excitement of everything. Yeah, no, no. Definitely. I mean, there was a lot of learning on the fly and, um, you know, putting my ego on the side. I think that that was a big thing. I mean, for me, I had to take pressure off of the, the, my competitor was myself. So I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, I know when you go out doing your you know, training and stuff, you're kind of competitors yourself out there, you know, you're, you're your worst enemy and you could be your biggest cheer, right? Whatever goes on in your mind. Um, so for me, you know, I really had to focus on taking my ego put on the side, be smart about this. Don't push too hard. Don't train too hard. Um, and, you know, do the best I can do on that day, you know, regardless of the situation. And it's less about the outcome for me. It was more about inspiring others and what I can learn along the way. And when I took that kind of off my shoulders, it allowed me to train a little bit smarter than just being like, I got to train, train, train and overtraining. I can fall into that ditch really easy for me. So, um, that was really key. The mindset also going into it. Yeah. The mindset of the event, I think is one thing. And then there's also the mindset of the, you know, everything kind of leading up to it. And one thing I try to focus on with my clients and myself is just, okay, we have this kind of big end goal or this event that we're preparing for. And when you first kind of, in your case, kind of come up with the idea of it, there's like this wave of excitement and motivation where you're just kind of chomping at the bit to get at it. But as you kind of move through the process of preparing for it, sometimes that initial excitement tends to fade a bit. And I find that if you can have like a scaffolding in place where, where are these kind of benchmarks along the way or these mini goals where I can kind of get a little bit of a boost from a motivational standpoint or a mindset standpoint yeah. by kind of clicking those off. That's when I find myself kind of staying excited and motivated more evenly paced throughout the course of a buildup for an event is that something that you're doing? And if so, what were some of the targets you were kind of aiming for along the way to keep that side of things a little more exciting? Yeah. I mean, so a big thing that's really important to me is, is uh, celebrating the small successes. Um, especially if you put so much emphasis on the end goal itself and something goes wrong, it can be extremely devastating. 
um, both on like a mental standpoint and, and a lo- all the above. So along the way, I mean, when I looked at this event, my goal is like, okay, Alex, like all you have to do is think of one day at a time, you know, like a lot of times training for this, it was like one day at a time focus. I mean, I had a, had a build out for my plan. I know what days I want to do. I know where I wanted to get to, but it was really like, just get to the next day, just train and get to the next day and kind of keep building that momentum and looking at the weeks. Um, you know, in the mental mindset, you know, there's certain things I definitely did for training, um, you know, longer durations of cardio, um, even just walking for actually long, long periods of time, just to mentally be engaged with something for a long time and kind of keep going. Um, some particular target like marks I tried to hit was being able to do like an EMOM for like an hour, or I really wanted to hit being able to do the event, at least half the event before I was it, before I actually did the event and see how I felt. And so I was able to hit that marker uh, about, I would say, a month and a half or a little over before the event, I did about half the event and I felt pretty good. And that kind of built my confidence up for the event itself. Um, but yeah, having those little goals to hit and realizing, you know, when I get a couple of days done or, you know, going into a day and making sure, you know, I'm, I'm doing as well as I did the day last time I trained. And if I felt like I also really regressed um, in my training that day, I would just wouldn't train at all that day and just stop. So the goal too was really listening to my body and making sure that like, I wasn't again, putting my ego aside. So I wasn't pushing myself too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it kind of fits into the recovery side of the equation as well was uh, other than just kind of listening to your body and just knowing what you know about yourself from all the other sports you've done historically, was there anything you were doing to kind of assess whether you were recovered and ready to kind of go into another workout? one One of my rules I have in general, when it comes to, um, things with high intensity that if I go into a workout and I, for example, can't lift the same weight I did the last time, or I'm really struggling, I call it a day. I just literally be like, look, today's a day off. I'm not going to change today. That's okay. Because then it's just a poor quality workout. And I feel for me, like when I have poor quality workouts, I'm more likely to get injured. Um, other things I would do to assess for workout is I would look at my resting heart rate on a daily basis. So I know like my baseline. So I'd take like you know, four days of pure recovery, right? Get my resting baseline for my heart rate. Um, And then I would assess, and if that resting heart rate got above like 10%, then I'd be like, okay, like there's too much catabolic breakdown. My heart's working too hard. There's too much byproduct that's being pushed. I need to take a day off of rest. And I'd look at my heart rate, make sure it went back down again. Um, Because you do get a lot of buildup, especially this high intensity stuff. And you you can get a lot of muscle breakdown. So I was looking at that. Um, you know, I also went to the doctors. There's, um, there's some like blood work you can also check out where you have like how much breakdown you have in your body of muscle and how much your kidneys are being taxed. And after like the time I did that half workout, cause I was really curious to see, um, you know, how I would perform or the safety behind doing such a high intensity workout would be. So after that half day I went in, got, I think it's like my CPK levels, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, checked. And like above a thousand is when you start to go in that zone of like, you could have like, you're potentially looking at like areas, issues with your kidneys. Mm. And after that half day, like I was kind of creeping in that direction, but you know, I didn't have any blood in my urine, um, like anything with like certain dehydration symptoms and other stuff. So I felt still pretty good, but I mean, there's definitely things I, I look for even my blood work and markers to make sure that I wasn't putting my kidneys at risk or just too much muscle breakdown, or just having poor quality workouts where it could lead to injury. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think, yeah, you, you're, you kind of preempted a little bit my next question, because I think the, there's one, one side of the equation is the doing of this activity. And then the next side is, well, how do you keep doing it for six hours plus? Like, <laughs> there's, there's obviously going to be like a fueling and a hydration equation in there, that you have to kind of have a plan for going in. And just the nature of the activities you're doing too, is it's like this kind of almost interesting blend of high or intensity melded with longer endurance, I would imagine. Uh, What type of, what were you kind of using to maybe gauge hydration at all? Were you you going by thirst? Did you have to include a lot of electrolytes with that? And then what was kind of your fueling strategy for the event itself? And how did you implement it while all doing that stuff? Yeah. So a couple of things like, even on, um, so a couple of things. So I'm going to step back the question even further. 
so during the training for it, um, I use a method to determine how much hydration I need. So when I do like practice sessions, I'm like, okay, like my EMOM style, for example, my EMOM style for the event was five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 10 squats, every minute on the minute. Then after 15 minutes, take a minute off. Now the rest periods did change a little bit as the event went on towards the further end because my body and mentally and physically needed a little more rest. Um, but when it comes to hydration, when I practice this, what I would do is I'd strip down, basically being naked, go on a scale, weigh myself before I started training. And then after like drink what I thought was a good amount of water, record how much water I was drinking. And then after I was done training for that period of time, I'd go weigh myself again and see what my weight difference was. And if I was more on target to where I was before, that meant like my hydration was good. If I lost several pounds of, of uh, weight, that meant I needed to reassess and readjust my hydration. Um, so that was really important. In the beginning of all this too, like I definitely did not consume enough carbohydrates. I was a little too focused on protein intake. And I was just, because these are such like high intense intervals, constant EMOM style workouts without those glycogen stores. Like I was like, you know, doing these like 20 minute, like, uh, you know, assault bike push-ups or whatever it was. And I just feel like, start to feel like crap, but I'd be like, am I just like fatiguing muscularly? So that's when I reached out to have a nutritionist work with me, Nancy Clark. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she really increased my carbohydrates significantly. And I also had this whole thing about like, I wasn't always a big fan of like consuming a lot of sugary products, but the fact that I'm just burning off so quickly and I need that quick fuel source. Um, you know, I, it was getting calories in my fluid definitely made a big difference as I'm training, working out or whatever I'm doing. Um, when it came to, as I was also training too, another thing I was told is actually to eat a lot of, of uh, arugula. Um, arugula can actually help with lactic acid buildup. I don't know the exact science behind it, but that was something else Nancy suggested to me. So I was like eating arugula, like lunch and dinner, like every day. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe that happened. Maybe that definitely helps. I don't know, but whatever. I kind of just took it and ran with it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I know for ultra marathons for me specifically too, like something that's like a six hour event, I can usually get away with doing just liquid nutrition. If I want to yeah. go that route, uh, when I start pushing up in kind of like the double digit hour time frame, it's where I really notice that it probably benefits me to have some solid food options kind of blended in there. Sure, too. Sure, sure. And I mean, some of it's like silliness to the degree of like palate fatigue, where like you just get sick of the same thing over and over again. So you're like, okay, I'm going to introduce something that's got a different consistency, different texture and other parts is just, uh, um, I think having that solid food can maybe help a little bit with digestion if you're getting out into those like longer events. But I am kind of curious about what types of foods or, uh, like things you were taking in during the event itself and at what, what, uh, uh, quantity. So like, did you track, like I uh, took X number of grams of carbohydrate per hour or anything like that? Yeah. So kind of even something back a little step before that. I mean, when I was training for this, one of the biggest things that was emphasized is learning what your body can tolerate for fuel. Mm -hmm. Um, I went out to OCR worlds out in Iceland. I remember one of the top competitors, um, he wasn't it to like had a chance to win the whole thing. And he started to eat some stuff he's never eaten before. And he got super sick and it, like cost him the event. So learning from that, like, like I would literally, if I'm in the gym for more than like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, like at a max, like I'm eating something, I'm just constantly eating something. I was practicing eating food while I was training, seeing what I could, um, fuel for fire. Like they were awesome. They sent me a lot of great like products. Cause that's kind of like a baby food that you kind of can swallow, has some protein, has some carbs in it. Um, I eat a lot of sweet potatoes to the point where actually it was turning a little bit orange happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, there's those, uh, banana, um, I would eat peanut butter jelly sandwiches for the event itself. Like I had fuel for fire. I, I went in wanting to consume more of like solid foods, but what happened is the event itself. So it was actually 45 degrees out and freezing rain. And I had a little tent over me and this idea of doing this, this was originally supposed to be indoors and it kind of shifted to an outdoor event at the end because it was that Fallen Here Memorial, really symbolic, great for video. Um, so this whole outdoor, outdoor weather actually really affected my ability to eat food. It just, the freezing cold kind of really shocked me and maybe actually not hungry at all. So in the beginning, in the beginning of the event, I was a bit nauseous and the only thing I could get down was um, liquid 
like Gatorades and stuff with, with calories in it. And then I started to switch to like cliff bars, fuel for fire, had some bananas and I tried to eat some like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which usually were kind of like my go-to um, to kind of mix up those macros in there a little bit. But, you know, I really, for me, honestly, if I could do it again, I would have pushed more calories earlier. And just, even if I wasn't hungry or even feeling it, just force myself to eat that a bit more. So yeah, it probably could have been a little better creating a little more of a schedule, but I hit those challenges. You got to kind of go with it and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's uh, one of those things that you can account for as much as you can try to anyway. And, but then inevitably something's going to happen that you either didn't plan for, or you thought the odds of this happening is low. So I, I find like the mindset for events that are long like that is, is almost like, okay, prepare for the things you can control. But at a certain point, you kind of have to stop worrying about all the potential things that could happen and just get yourself in a mindset of something's going to happen that I can't predict. When it happens, I need to have the right mental uh, approach to kind of tackle that. So that when it happens, you don't end up dwelling on it too long and having it cost you performance later on because you're kind of fixated on it. Was that something that you kind of went into the event thinking like, or something you practiced in your training, or did you use it at all? When you say, when you say use it all, just say that one more time. You're talking about. So like when, with an event like this, uh, there's like almost the way I maybe look at it is like, there's no such thing as a perfect day for something yeah. like that. Something's okay. going to happen that you didn't account for just from the length of time you're out there. Uh, did you do anything like from a mental preparation standpoint where you were going in knowing that and thinking when something I didn't assume was going to happen happens, this is going to be the way I kind of direct my mind. Yeah. I mean, so a couple of things that was really helpful. One is having good team with you. Um, I surrounded myself by <laughs> my counter who counted all my reps. I made sure, um, Bobish, really funny guy. I, I needed a little humor in the place. This kind of keep me a little soft and keep me entertained. So he was, he was always able there to, I mean, he was strict. Like, like if I had stepped to the side, he would get me right back in and all the above. So he kept me in line. And then other people, um, I gave certain roles and had some other people just checking on me and make sure I was hydrated and fueled. Um, but when things kind of go out of whack, I mean, basically going into the last week of the event was a big shell shock. I actually had a leg injury and I wasn't sure if he's even going to get better by the day of the event. So like I had to be like, okay, like if I can't do squats, like I'm doing a big fundraiser, um, what am I going to do? So I'm like thinking about, okay, maybe I'll try to do like 3000 sit-ups or like something else. I was trying to get really creative and I was still going to go through and be like, I'm going to do the squats if I can. Um, so in the way beginning about a week out, I was already brainstorming how to be creative if things started to like go out of whack. Um, and the week before I actually also had to take the entire week off from working out, just to make sure my leg was going to be okay and take care of my body, which was a little, you know, I just had a flow with it. I usually like having some movement the week before, but I literally had to eliminate a lot of movement. Um, so because those things kind of threw me off earlier, made me think about the event and, you know, having extra thing to keep me warm was important. Um, a bunch of different types of food, but different drinks. But again, going back, having a team that can easily solve for problems when I'm just focusing on doing a feat. I think that was the biggest, uh, biggest help in that area. Hey folks, just a reminder, this episode's sponsors include Inside Tracker's top-notch blood panel offerings for 25% off all HPO listeners and Element Electrolytes free sample pack for all HPO listeners. Links in the show notes or at zachbetter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. That's interesting. Is it uh, something you're going to try to do again to see if you can get it done <laughs> even quicker? Or is this like, okay, that was a fun uh, project, but there's plenty of other projects I want to get to. I mean, if I was going to do it again, I, I definitely believe I could actually do it faster. Um, there's a lot of things going back to training. Like if you were to say like, what would you have done different in training? Um, on a side note there, I probably would have done focused on some days where I take weight off of me and just focus on pure high repetition endurance, like put a band on me and do pull-ups and high reps. And then have other times where I focus more on intensity and low reps instead of doing the high volume and high intensity together. So there's definitely things I think I could have done earlier and put myself in less of a recovery hole. But when I do these like fitness feats for these causes, um, I think they're pretty much for me one and done meaning that next time it's going to be something very different. And, you know, I fully planned out in the near future now. 
um, and just kind of keep it a little more creative and keep shooting for the stars and seeing what the limit is the human body can kind of take. Yeah, I had a feeling you're going to say that based on your kind of athletic background, you seem like a curious guy who wants to try a lot of different stuff. So uh, repeating sometimes takes away another opportunity when you when you have an imagination like that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like when you repeat it, you kind of can. It can be good sometimes. It can almost kind of just set you up to like just go downhill. If something goes wrong, you don't hit those right numbers. So when you do something new, it always brings a new opportunity, a new goal set, some new record, something creative. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's shift gears a little bit here and chat a bit about just your approach kind of with this stuff or your history before maybe getting into it, uh, because you 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 I guess you always probably suffer from depression if you've had it. And it's more of how do I manage this? Can you tell us just a little bit about kind of your background with depression and, and what maybe led you to these types of activities as a way to uh, kind of support that? Yeah. So with my background of depression, um, it really built me a structure to have a very strong mind. In a lot of ways, the worst I ever was in my depression, those days, I know that no matter how hard I push myself physically, mentally, professionally, it's never going to be as hard as those worst days in my depression, which I feel like really gives me an edge when I go out there and do these crazy fitness feats or I like one day I decided to like lunge down the entire beach of Revere and see how far I could get. You know, it's just like just knowing that you've been to the worst definitely helps with these fitness feats. Um, my personal history. So when I was a sophomore in high school, I left college. Uh, I left actually, I used to do, um, I was training hopefully to go towards the Olympics and sailboat racing. And I was in college, I was dealing with some depression and I tried selling in nationals. And doing the thing that I absolutely love doing that means the world to me, being on the ocean, being in the water where there's no triggers, I then was having thoughts of wanting to end my life. And at that point in time, I was like, okay, like I need to go home. I need to get better. And my struggle, you know, it went on for a decade. Um, I myself dealt with a lot of suicid suicidal ideation for several years. Um, I was very determined to get better. I didn't know what to do. It was a very scary experience, which I know a lot of people can, you know, have gone through. Uh, I put myself in the hospital multiple times, saw a bunch of different treaters, went through pretty much any treatment out there, ECT, medications, ketamine infusions, kind of was very, you know, tried it all. Um, and, you know, had all these doctors diagnosing me, was on, uh, was eventually on disability where I couldn't, because um, I couldn't hold a job and nor I was able to make money. And people are telling me like, this is the quality of your life. You know, you need to kind of step back and realize that you're not going to be able to hold a job and you kind of need to reevaluate expectations. Um, me and who I am as a person and knowing where I came from and knowing where I was at that moment in time, you know, I wasn't going to willing, I wasn't willing to accept the answer. And I also was in a place where there's like, I was basically taking all the control of my situation um, away from me because I was highlighting and being like, you know, there's some medication or some treatment out there that's going to fix me and fix all my problems. And when you do that, like there may be, and maybe that would be helpful, but there are things that like I then took away from myself that I could help myself. And eventually what I looked at is like, okay, like I need to step back and figure out what I can do to help myself and empower myself to get better. And that's when I started focusing on the sleep, like constant wake and sleep schedule was really important. Getting good quality sleep, focusing on nutrition, like eating throughout the day. Um, so that wouldn't affect like my motivation, my energy level, you know, finding out what my body did like, what it didn't like, you know, good supplements, help with inflammation, gut health, um, the fitness piece, like not just like exercising, um, but find the right amount of exercise, making sure too, that on a regular basis, I'm not over exercising. Cause that can also go on a negative, negative slope too. And then one of the biggest pieces also was community. Um, you know, finding a community of people. And I know like out there there's runners, um, or other athletes, but that community was so important to me. And I found, I actually started going to a rock climbing gym. I met other people that, you know, pursued fitness and health and wellness. And that really inspired me and got me motivated, uh, to move forward. Um, so those were some really important things in my life that kind of got me out of it, but yeah, no. And, and even now, I mean, when I say, you know, I've overcome the challenges 
a major depression, it doesn't mean my depression's gone. I still deal with depression. Um, I still have some weeks that are a lot more challenging. Other weeks, some days are a lot more challenging. Um, but the idea is I know skills now and I know how I can get myself out of those holes and, you know, go towards my goals and, uh, keep moving and, uh, kind of pursue the life I want to pursue. So mm -hmm. a little bit about me. Yeah. It's really interesting. Cause I think with like depression, the, the, the real hard part about it is when you're at your worst, the motivation to do the things that are going to pull you out of it is so low that it's really hard to almost take that first step to kind of get to that part where it starts to kind of spiraling more in a positive direction. And it seems like a lot of folks will turn to sports or exercise and things like that as one thing that they can do that, that perhaps kind of like jump starts that, or that they can continue to add to, to help kind of pull them, pull them out of there. And it, I, I just imagine like, it's so hard to self-start that so that you mentioned the community side of it where, you know, having friends or people who are aware that, you know, for you, maybe like, well, Alex is, you know, I haven't heard from Alex in a few days. Maybe we should reach out and see if he wants to go for, a, you know, a group run or a group training session or something like that it can be a very powerful kind of tool to have in your toolbox uh, as you kind of go through your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, no, I think 100%. Um, you know, when it comes to motivation too, something is action precedes motivation. Um, even if you don't feel motivated in the moment by taking one step, and that might be like putting your shoes on and walking out the door. Like maybe you don't feel like going for a run and maybe the run is like one of the best things for you right now, but just by putting your shoes on, getting out the door, getting the sunlight, like that can start to build momentum. Or even if you like, you really don't want to be around people, but you know, you know, it'd be better for you and you'll fitness be better for you. Like when you actually get out there and start doing that, like that motivation comes with these things too, with like being around people or community, like what I think to myself when I'm having a really off day is like, okay, so if I put my shoes on, go out the door, or if I go meet like John for a run, is that going to make my situation worse? That's what I ask myself. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, then I might as well, it's not going to make my situation any worse than it currently is, then I might as well go do it and give it a try. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes, makes total sense. And I, I would imagine over just years of more or less trial and error, you start identifying, you know, like situations where you can, you can pretty much predict it ahead of time and you know, you'll get that return on your, your exercise investment that, that, that's going to come from it. But it is, it is a, you know, I guess we call it type two fun for a reason, because a lot of times the work is hard in the moment, the reward is afterwards. I think it's probably just even that much more powerful for someone who is, uh, who's working on depression. Yeah. And even with like the reward piece, um, if you are in a real deep low, like sometimes you do something and sometimes you don't feel reward. I mean, that can be part of the depression itself too. And the idea is what I really emphasize is like marginal gains, meaning that when you do these things, like even if you don't immediately feel it, like it adds a little percent towards that goal, or it's going to add a little percent to eventually feeling better. Um, so the more and more you do it, the more likely you have more opportunities to have to feel better. And over time, you will feel better. But it's true, like that moment, you may not feel it, but you got to still keep pushing towards it. If it can add like half a percent, and then you do something else that adds half a percent before you know it, you're like 5% better. Like every little thing counts. And it might take a little time to build that momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that I'm kind of interested on this topic too, is regardless of whether someone's dealing with depression or not, I think a lot of times when you have like these big projects uh, and it seems maybe it's a little more heavily towards physical type things where sure. you do all the work to get ready for it. You do the actual event, things go well, the accomplishment is kind of like this climax of finishing it, checking that goal off and, you get this like wave of, uh, of accomplishment, uh, and excite excitement, but then you wake up the next day and you're like, Oh, I, I have this big hole here that is uh, not being filled by, you know, however long it was that you had been on that process. Is there tools or things that you use to kind of navigate that time frame when you finish a big project and you know, there's going to probably be maybe an off season or at least a change of schedule in order to kind of keep, keep yourself motivated and, uh, not fall into depression? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. There's actually, um, someone I was just talking to recently about this. So when I do a big event, I always try to make sure I plan like some type of positive event after it, whether it's like 
a little vacation, a trip with friends, a trip with family, um, because usually there is that excitement. And then all of a sudden, you just, for me, I sometimes feel very alone because there's such a buildup, such a preoccupation. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, like it's done. Like, what do I do now? So having like an immediate kind of thing to do or look forward to after the event, like a week out, two weeks out. And then also usually when I do an event in the back of my mind, I'll put something in the calendar, even if it's several months out, just to know that there is something else in the future, look forward to, or something else that like I will be training for, or, you know, getting engaged in um, to keep my mindset focused moving forward instead of just spinning in my head after an event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having those kind of scaffolding, I guess we can maybe call it in place. I think probably very important. And I mean, it's just an interesting thing. It makes sense when you think about it of like, you've invested so much time going into something and then it's, it's not there anymore. And uh, in the ultra running community, I think sometimes it le leads to a little bit of uh, maybe overexposure because then you find yourself day after, okay, I'm looking for the next race. And then maybe you, <laughs> you, you preempt your off season a little too quickly, but uh, I think having those, uh, those processes in place are going to be, is a valuable piece of advice for anyone, regardless of whether they feel like they have depression or not. Um, did, uh, did you find that like your other sports, uh, that you've done in the back or in the past, are those things that kind of, uh, were other, like outlets for, for dealing with depression too, or did you get into sports at an early age, just out of kind of curiosity? And then they kind of presented themselves as a way to kind of help with that, that type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so I never took medication for depression until, um, I never took medication in general. So I was a soft freshman in college. And then like, you know, the doctor's like, Oh, we got to treat your ADHD and blah, blah, blah. But the ways like I would manage like I was always hyperactive. So like physical activity came a little natural to me. Um, I also did have a little bit of a temper, um, growing up. And so like I did wrestling, my two sports were sail sailing in the summer and wrestling in the winter. And I had a little bit of seasonal depression. So doing wrestling definitely gave me a, an outlet, um, especially with the seasonal depression, the winter coming on. And then when I was a little more able to relax and engage being out in the elements with sailing on the ocean, where you're away from stressors at home or school and just being in a whole different element really was like uh anti-anxiety, the best anti-anxiety treatment I could possibly go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think wrestling being the team sport would maybe introduce both the physical component as well as the community involvement. And, sure. you know, the, I, since college, I've essentially been in a sport where it's pretty individual in the sense that, you know, the races a lot of times, but I have had a few opportunities to compete with team USA for the hundred kilometer road, uh, world championships. And there's always that kind of reminder when you do something like that, where you're just like, there's this like little bit of extra excitement and motivation when you know, like, Hey, if I do something, uh, or if I make a mistake here, or if I like lax on my, my drive to find my best possible race, it's not just me. I'm letting down. There's kind of a group of other people as well. So, uh, I would think that that would maybe be something that would be, be a little more inviting for someone. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the whole team component, I, I fully agree. I mean, uh, I mean, team members, they can also, you know, if, if they can see what you're struggling on, they can help you improve. I mean, one big thing for me too, like creating a community, a team or people you're training with training around other people that, you know, either inspire you have similar goals or at, or at your similar training level, because those are people where you're going to learn, you're going to develop good behaviors um, and making sure that community, you know, again, is at that level. If you're training around a lot of people that are lower level than you are, you might develop those habits too. So also it's like those people you're surrounding yourself with, you definitely start to develop their habits. Um, that morale, you know, that excitement, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, I want to maybe shift a little bit away from sport and take a peek at like just your lifestyle in general, or sure. I guess you could call it career. Uh, I find it interesting. I think sports in general, when they get big enough or nowadays with social media and these like being able to essentially create your own event is creates kind of a situation where you can, if you find yourself doing quite well at something you can turn it into a job you can potentially live like a professional athlete. Uh, but I don't know that that's always necessarily in a lot of people's best interest, just because you 
have the opportunity to be able to kind of build your life around this particular activity and really fine tune things. But it also kind of sets you up to a point where when you have a bad day, there's not a lot to kind of say, well, I'll like focus on this now for a little bit to take my mind off of that as I get ready to kind of like try to correct the mistakes I made or whatever happened that didn't go the way you wanted it to. And I know you have a bit of a career outside of just your own performance stuff where you work with other people to help them kind of find their best self, whether it be, you know, in the corporate office or a physical endeavor that they're taking on. How does that kind of fit into your lifestyle from not getting in the way of your own physical preparation, but also maybe complementing it in a way that would otherwise be be difficult to not have something to maybe fall back on? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, there's a lot of things I can improve on. We'll start there for a second. <laughs> when, when I when I did this event, I mean, I, I'd like to say everything I'm doing is perfect. It's great. You know, I'm, I'm crushing it all. But I mean, I, I definitely hit my challenges. And as long as I keep myself in a growth mindset where I'm constantly learning, you know, that's how you keep improving, right? Um, when I was doing this event, I did, you know, I worked very hard um, for several months and I saved up some money. And then when I did this event I was training for, like I dialed back my work a little bit. And because I really wanted to focus on the event, had to build out this whole fundraising component, all these different elements. And I was really trying to build a brand around it and really help people with mental health. When the event was over, I was like, you know, I, I kind of still kind of went off some of the hype and all this stuff. But then I was kind of looking at my own like savings and being like, all right, Alex, like you need to like put your foot on that gas like tenfold to get back into making some like money. Um, so it was a little bit of an eye opener. Um, but helping people, I mean, I also live vicariously throughout my the people I work with. Um, and it allows me, I'm also on my feet, I'm engaged, I'm talking. But, you know, anywhere from, Again, you know, I've worked with athletes, um, whether they're training for big events, adventure athletes, uh, or people who are also overcoming their own mental health struggles. Like they might be a high performer and, you know, they're trying to run a business and all of a sudden they hit up here in their life where they are dealing with depression and they're trying to navigate of, you know, how do they still perform at a high level while battling, you know, some of these mental setbacks um, and helping them work through that and giving them, mentoring them in some ways, you know, and teaching them um, and coaching them about kind of, you know, this little steps they can do to incorporate in their life to make things a little easier and a little more. Um, I also focus a lot on sustainability. That's really important. Not just, not just doing something here and now that's like amazing, but looking like what you can do over a period of time is sustainable. Um, but working with these people, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to see what people are capable of doing, what people are capable of, of pushing through. Um, I have a woman I worked with and we, I've worked with and she's um, so she is a blind sailor. Um, she's had her own struggles and she lives on a boat and she's like, I think about 60 years old right now, but she's uh, you know, she's sailboat race and she's completely blind. Mm -hmm. um, and she has her challenges in life that we work through and, you know, also talk about sailboat racing and getting her ready for the next event. Um, but all different people, all different spectrums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause I think like, you're working with folks perhaps that are taking on things that are way more diverse than perhaps I am. I'm mo working mostly with runners for the, for the most part. Uh, but you have kind of an extensive background in a variety of different things, as well as just the, the mindset side of it. So do you find yourself when you're working with folks like this pinpointing, Oh, I got it keep that one in the back of my head. Cause this particular client is going to be a, a big source of motivation for me on a future project or a future workout that I maybe need a little extra push. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sometimes, I mean, when I meet my clients, they sometimes, I don't know if they realize this, but they, there's good times that they motivate me more than I don't know than I know if I'm motivating them at that moment. I mean, just talking to them and seeing how hard they're pushing through and how they're taking my advice and it's really helping them also reminds me that I need to do a better job taking my own advice because sometimes it's hard for me to follow through on certain things. Um, but yeah, I mean, knowing these people and what they've gone through and what they've overcome, you know, the fact that they got up that morning, they got their job done, they got their training in, regardless of what challenges they're facing, um, is definitely brings inspiration to me on a daily basis, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I always find like when I do have a client who, uh, you know, makes a, a lot of progress over a timeline, but you know, they're not like winning races or, you know, even finishing the top half. 
they tend to be some of the more inspiring folks. And they're oftentimes like, they don't, they don't suspect that you're being inspired by them either. So it's, <laughs> it's always a kind of a fun, uh, fun conversation. And, you know, one that I've uh, seen a lot in the last few years that I find really inspiring is when you have these, you have people who are like, just have an incredible amount of weight to lose and they decide, sure. okay, I'm going to take this on. And the reason I find it so interesting is, you know, I mean, some of these people, they lose like hundred, 200 pounds. And it's just something that is probably different enough from anything I've had to experience in my life that it kind of catches my, my eye or my ear in the sense of just like wanting to maybe understand like the mindset of that. And I'm sure like people think the same thing about you and me with the stuff that we do where, you know, like what's going through your head when you, you run hundred miles or when you do the 6,000 challenge and that sort of stuff where, you know, my mind goes to how do you even like start planning out this process of uh, you know, I need to lose a hundred pounds and then get there and stay there. Some of those type of things are always interesting. You just never know what, what's going to kind of catch your attention from the inspiration side. No, I, I agree. I mean, I have, um, you know, recently I, I've been working with a girl, uh, who has muscle degenerative disease and I've been mm -hmm. working with her since I think she was about 15 or 16. And, and now she's going off to, uh, she's going off to college and, um, you know, she has some, challenges with with stability with foot dexterity and I actually take her to a rocking gym when we work together a rock climbing gym when we work together because it creates a bit of passion and and, and drive for her to get you know be in charge of her physical fitness but seeing her like regardless of how much you know stability things she's challenged with or how much she's struggling with putting her foot on the rock climbing wall and she like goes in that wall and she will not come off that wall off that wall until she reaches the top, no matter what, like she could literally be there all day long. And for me to see that and what she overcomes and what she tackles um, to me is, is, I think is inspiring and really big. So, yeah, I mean, the things that go on throughout their mind, I think is um, incredible. And I, I have a lot to learn from all my clients just as much as I hopefully I could teach them too. Awesome. Uh, so what is coming up next for you on the, the physical endeavor side of things? Do you have any projects that you're currently planning and training for? Yeah, I do. I have one, uh, my next beat that is going to be January 2nd. Um, what I'm going to be doing, it's, it's an Everest challenge. So that basically means that it's the height of Mount Everest. So 29,029 feet. And I'll be rock climbing that total height with a weighted vest um, so I'll be doing this indoors at Brooklyn boulders in Somerville. It'll be on a 50 foot wall and I'm going to be climbing that 50 foot wall 581 times. <laughs> um, and the goal is within 24 hours. So talk about being ambitious. You know, this is, this is definitely going to be one in the books. Yeah, that's 24 hours of anything is a lot. And I think uh, as someone who is staying more uh, horizontal in my forward movement, <laughs> going going up and down for that is, is incredible. I'll have to uh, tune into that. Is that going to be, do you, do you, are you going to live stream that by any chance or anything like that? Or Yeah, so my last event, um, what I'm looking to do is also uh, partner up with Spartan. My last event, I partnered up with Spartan. And what we did, um, we live streamed it. And along with the live stream, we got other people who are veterans, uh, people who are in the mental health space. They would come on as so the screen would be split. You'd have me doing the event and they would come on and be, you know, talking about either things that they've been through, talk about what I'm doing, but creating a lot of dialogue and, you know, something makes something really interesting. So um, I'm hoping to do the same thing and do it over a 25 hour period. And so it'll be a little, uh, little marathon to watch. Mm -hmm. and uh hopefully get a big audience but yeah i'm looking to partner up with spartan and spartan again yeah no that's a great idea i know uh i did uh a treadmill uh live stream a couple i guess about a year and a half ago at this point and originally i was like well i'm gonna live stream it mostly just so i have a documentation of it and then you know you get to thinking like well who's gonna want to watch someone just <laughs> on a treadmill for 12 hours <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and it's like, you, but you can get pretty creative with that stuff. You bring in, you know, a variety of different guest speakers and things like yeah. that. In your case, some motivational stuff, uh, um, people telling their stories that you can, people can multitask while they're watching you kind of get, you know, one, one foot closer uh, on the screen next to it. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, is there anything that you are going to 
how, how are you going to train for that one? I guess maybe let's go down that rabbit hole for a little bit. Is it going to yeah. be, obviously you're going to be doing some rock climbing, but you're going to wear the weight vest again, right? Yeah. When the weighted vest, uh, to be honest, it's yet to be decided whether it's gonna be 10 pounds or 20 pounds. Uh, the goal is a 20 pound vest. Um, I mean, I've trained some people for the Olympics and rock climbing. And usually when it gets to some gnarly climbs, like the most I have on them is 10 pounds. My climb I'm going to be doing is a five, six. It's going to be an easy climb. And I've talked mm -hmm. to a lot of people about this. It needs to be an easy climb in order to complete 581 times. Cause I don't want to tweak any fingers. Um, so as I go on, I'm going to kind of figure that piece out. The training part of this, I've been in discussion with a bunch of people. I mean, I'd like to think, you know, I'm smart enough to figure out the whole thing myself, but I always love bringing other people together, getting more creativity and really kind of narrowing down what makes the most sense, especially from learning from my previous event. So one of my biggest worries with something with this much volume into it is that I'm going to get injured in the training. Okay. And whether it's injured in the preparation or injured in the event itself. So what we already got in the, we were, we were, what we've already established is I'll be doing pretty much on an every other day basis, um, a thermal scan. So um, I have a little device where I can stand in front of it. You can see the thermal energy. Basically you can see the heat from my body in both my left and my right sides. And I'll, I'll particularly be looking at my fingers, but if my one side's deviating from the other by a couple of degrees, and we can see the heat, the, um, the heat from that area, that'll be an indicator that there's some potential inflammation and swelling hmm. before I even feel the pain. And that will let me know, like, I need to take a day off from that area or it's going to cause injury. So the idea is kind of getting really, really focused on injury prevention while I'm training. Um, and then along with that, really focusing on the endurance aspect. So I'll be doing a lot probably with like an assault bike, a lot with climbing up and down the wall, um, just multiple repeats. Um, but assault bike, armorgometer, and also focusing on like keeping up some of my strength. Um, some people have asked me like, Alex, you know, are you going to lose, are you going to lose a lot of weight for this? And my thing for them is I don't like that stressor of I'm going to lose weight because I feel like that then pushes me in a direction where I'm doing things in my body that it might not want to do. So I'll, whatever my body does while I prepare for this event is what's going to happen. And naturally, if I'm training this much endurance, I'm probably going to lose weight, but I'm not going to push that. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because it's like, obviously you're looking for performance here and there is probably a quote unquote ideal power weight for you at the individual level, but you got to be able to do it. So yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if that's the weight that it would be on perfect on paper, if it's going to cause you to get hurt to get there, or uh, it just doesn't have, have you at a position where uh, on, on event day, you're, you're equipped to, to tolerate the 24 hours, then it's, it's, it's just something you kind of have to deviate from. But, um, so 24 hours, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, you will lose at least one night's of sleep for this particular <laughs> project. And, uh, if uh, my understanding is you do not consume caffeine, is that correct? Yeah. I haven't had caffeine for over seven years now. Oh, wow. um, and I actually, so I have not had caffeine and I don't eat chocolate either. And I don't have decaf, zero, nothing with caffeine at all. Is that, was that driven by something or did you just find that it, what caffeine wasn't all it was cracked out to be for you at the individual level? Yeah. So, I mean, on a personal level, like for people having caffeine, I mean, I think there's pros and cons to it. I mean, I think overall, I think people consume too much of it and I'm all about like having something, if you, if you really need it, make sure it can work well. If you consume it all the time, it's not going to do its job. For me personally, I felt like there were certain things um, in my diet and things that I had to take out that would help my mood. And caffeine was one of them. When I actually had caffeine, I might feel good for a little bit, but I have a lot of dips and it mm. could affect me for a good period of time. So I just want to take all those variables out. Um, I, what I switched in though, I started taking a COQ10 and PQQ. It's a supplement. And what that does, it helps with mitochondrial density. And I actually find that, and I take a little like, like more than the recommended dose of that, but I found that over a couple months that actually gave me a lot of energy, um, that like kind of makes up or anything of taking caffeine and all those other stuff, but it's more of like a natural feeling of just energy and wakefulness. Um, so that's kind of like my substitute right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Caffeine is an interesting one because I mean, it's, it was well-researched as a performance, uh, sure. additive, but then, 
I, I, I always wonder about some of that stuff too, where it's like you get someone who's been off of it for quite a while uh, just, you know, what kind of like a reset that does. Cause every once in a while I'll see someone say, Oh, they quit caffeine. And at first it sucked, but then, you know, now I feel as good as I did when I would have that cup of coffee or whatever uh, all the time. So you, you yeah. have these, it's maybe a little more of a sustained energy versus those peaks and valleys that you kind of described. Yeah. And I was actually more recently uh, on a funny note, uh, my girlfriend, I was noticing how much caffeine she was consuming at a point and she was having like four cups of coffee a day. And then, um, she does like these, uh, bodybuilding competitions. Um, and she was having pre-workouts. She was like shotgunning pre-workouts. <laughs> and then like, like a little while later after like at the gym together, like she would be moody and her mood would be all over the place and she would get all upset about stuff. And I'm like, do you realize how much caffeine you're consuming or like what you're putting in your body? And it was after, and then she, she actually like made the connection and she cut out the pre-workout and she really cut down her caffeine intake. And, um, that actually really improved her mood and really stabilized it. And she didn't realize how much havoc that was actually having on her body with the amount she was putting in herself. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I know caffeine too. I mean, there's a, a wide range of effects it can have from one sure. person to the next. Some people are pretty high responders. Like I would be one of those, like I typically don't have issues where I feel like I develop a tolerance so I've been fortunate in that where, you know, if I have a cup of coffee in the morning, it basically is the same thing. I don't feel like now after a month of that, I need to have two to get the same effect or three to have the same effect. And I know other folks, it's like they'll have coffee or caffeine and it's just like hardly does anything. And, and then, uh, you know, I was reading somewhere just recently where if you go over a certain threshold of caffeine, it can almost have a reverse effect where you just, you know, you actually kind of get more groggy and tired too. So I always yeah. wonder about some of these people are having a ton of it. If it's like they hit that threshold, and they're just, For sure. you know, doing more damage than good. So it's, it's worth, you know, what I'll do sometimes is especially like in an off season, after I finish a, a goal race, I'll, I'll cut out caffeine for a week or so just to kind of see like what it feels like. And then what happens when I reintroduce it and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's an interesting experiment that I think uh, a lot of people can learn a lot from, from trying out. So, um, one thing I was going to ask, and I've forgotten to when, when, before I asked about the caffeine was you had mentioned the thermal scanner uh, that yeah. you were using to kind of gauge uh, inflammation and stressors on certain areas of your body. Is that a specific product that you use or is it just a generic kind of thermal scanner? Yeah. So I actually, so I just talked to my friend, Evan, my friend, Evan's done a lot with the SEAL team. Um, mm -hmm. He did a lot the, the, the issues, like the SEAL team were having a lot of problems where they're getting injured too often. So he started using this thermal scanner with the Navy SEALs um, to scan them before they start doing their training to see if they need to pull them or not to make sure they don't get injured. Um, he's actually, I don't have it with me yet, so I don't know the exact product, but he's sending, he's sending that to me for me to have. But I believe it's one that actually hooks into like an, an Apple phone. It like hooks right into your phone and you can hold it up to somebody and do like a thermal scan. That's cool. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting just the different ways that we have to gauge recovery and things like that. I know, uh, you know, heart rate variability has been a big one yeah. recently. And um, there's uh, the, a wave of like continuous glucose monitors too, to like, this is maybe different than from gauging recovery, but just to see kind of like, what's my body doing when and finding out just where if you, I guess if you record enough data, you can probably identify like good markers for you or a channel that you operate best in. And, uh, the gear is just getting more and more advanced and it's kind of an exciting, exciting thing to kind of learn about, but I do feel sometimes I, I can't keep up with all of it. So <laughs> you got, you got to pick and choose. I mean, yeah. You got to pick and choose. I, I have, um, I do have an aura ring, uh, that I like wearing most of the time. It kind of really helps me give a little perspective. It keeps me in check a little bit. Again, I'm very prone to overtrain and I, I know that about myself, but I'm happy to admit it. Um, so the aura ring gives me a little idea, like with heart rate variability, like what threshold I'm going into. And, and I check in with how do I feel? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing I also want to mention too, you were talking about the caffeine, something, one th when people look at performance, whether it's the events I do or other events, and they'll come to me being like, Alex, like I need to improve my performance. My first question I always ask is how is your sleep? Mm. All right. That's like the number one basic thing for me. Like sleep is like a non-negotiable. Like I always getting my seven, eight hours of sleep. That's like my magical number because that is going to help me recover better for the next day. Mentally beyond. I know people who don't get enough sleep and like 
they'll slip, they'll fall, they'll get injured, all the above, they don't recover well. Um, but sleep is like one of the biggest performance enhancers out there. And sometimes people just neglect the most basic, simple things. So like mastering the basics before you look at like all those crazy supplements, performance enhancing, whatever it is, like master the basics for me is, is super important. Yeah, that, no, that's an excellent point. And I, I remember like, probably this is a long time ago at this point, but I recognize that like, if I'm having caffeine after like any time in the PMs, I guess you can call it. Yeah, so yeah. anytime outside of the morning, it, I, I could have a pretty predictable experience where I'd probably fall asleep when I normally would, but then I'd wake up in the middle of the night, kind of wide awake. And then, you know, it might take a while to fall back asleep. And when I recognize like, yeah, I think, um, I want to say Matthew Walker was just talking about this, who does a lot with the you know, sleep quality stuff. And he was saying, you want a 10 hour break between caffeine and when you would typically go to bed in order to kind of get that out of your system and be able to have it not negatively impact your sleep quality. So, um, in your case, it's a, it's a, a non-factor, I guess, cause it's just <laughs> not going to be in your system, but yeah, the sleep quality, I, I do wonder about that. Cause I mean, tons of people are drinking caffeine like sure around dinner time even and i just i can't i can't imagine how terrible my sleep would go if yeah. i started going it that direction but it actually brings up a, a a fun topic too that i like to chat with people about sometimes where you know we have a lot of this uh these different like things you can do that will maybe help move the needle on performance or quality and things like that and a lot of the ones that look kind of exciting and new are oftentimes what I would call it kind of small movers or non-foundational things that the majority of folks out there would be better off taking care of those big blocks or those big movers first. And you mentioned you sleep is, you know, the, probably the biggest one in a lot of cases. Yep. Are there other big blocks that you're like, okay, I want to make sure if I'm working with someone, we square these away and fine tune these before we start doing any kind of like more smaller level, like biohacks or kind of interesting things that would maybe move the needle a little smaller. Yeah. So like part of my philosophy, um, there was a famous wrestler called Gable and he got, he got his, you know, gold medals in the Olympics. Um, what made him really, really good is that he knew a couple moves, a few moves from all directions. But those moves, like whatever his opponent threw at him, he knew how to hit those moves, no matter what. So my thing is all about mastering the basics. And when I say mastering the basics, I talk about sleep. I talk about nutrition. I talk about fitness, um, you know, even socializing community, like some of those basic elements, but not just mastering them when like, you know, you have a day that's perfectly scheduled, everything's going your way, but also like mastering sleep when, you know, you, you have, you're really stressed out. Things are chaotic. Um, other things are going on, like knowing how to tackle these simple things in unique situations. So kind of creating your own personalized manual for not just perfect situations, but for sometimes those situations that sneak up on us that, uh, can throw us in a lot of stress. Um, you know, outside of that, when it comes to performance, um, hydration, I mean, again, I'm talking about the simple things though, but people just neglect it. Mm -hmm. If you're dehydrated, and on an on, on emotional standpoint, if I'm dehydrated, I become apathetic, uh, my mood can drop, and I become, uh, my energy drops. So, I mean, like, some of these things are just so simple, but we just don't look at. Um, you know, when I step outside of that, and I start looking at, like, we talk about supplements and stuff, you know, I do take a couple supplements. Um, one I take, a lot of them are more for both physical and mental health. Um, there's a common one, creatine, monohydrate. And the reason I actually started taking it was because the studies came out showing that it can actually help depression and cognition. Um, and that was actually more interesting to me than about any of the strength benefits. So I actually take that on a regular basis, uh, like five grams of creatine a day, just for the mood benefits. Um, I also take like fish oil, uh, one to two grams of EPA and fish oil for the inflammation in the body. Also for like ADHD and mood. I said the PPQ, uh, COQ10 and PQQ, um, a little bit of vitamin D and, um, that's pretty much it, but I get all my other nutrition from food and everything else in my life. But again, like master the basics. And if, if someone's not getting the sleep, not take care of the nutrition, not take care of the fitness. Um, and also like not like socializing community is really important. If they don't have those in their life. For me, it's not even worth talking about like 
you know, if there's like a special peptide they should take or some additional supplement or like some particular biohack, like it's just not worth it. Like those move the needle so much more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes, makes total sense. And it, it, it gives you a blueprint as someone trying to help someone to where it's like, these are the ones that I know I need to dial in with this person. And they're going to see, especially if they were struggling with one of them. And usually most people probably are at least one of them. So you, know, you can really do them a big service by taking care of those before throwing them in an ice tub or a sauna. And <laughs> all, those are fun. But uh, obviously, I think those are a lot, a lot of times step two uh, type of sure. things. Um, one question I had uh, relative to the nutrition side of things for you, as long as we're kind of sure. sort of on that topic is, I find interesting when the folks are doing sports or activities where there may be an incredible range between what your energy demands are one day versus another day. So like people will always ask me like, well, what do you eat and how much do you eat in a day or how much do you run in a day? And I'm just like, well, it kind of depends. Like, you know, if I did a 30 mile <laughs> training run on Sunday, Monday is going to probably look quite a bit different. Uh, yeah. So from a nutritional standpoint, do you kind of have like a foundational or a set of foods that typically you like to focus on that kind of check the boxes. And then as the energy expenditure goes up, you start adding more to that, or is it all kind of individual to the activities you're doing? Yeah. So when it comes to nutrition, um, I'm a big person. I always start my morning off with a big breakfast. I have the ability to eat food and work out. Some people really have to eat on an empty, have to train on a more of an empty stomach but I've always been one that's able to hold down my food very well. Um, so like in the morning, I always start with my staple and that's like, I have almond milk with cereal with two scoops of, uh, whey protein and a little bit of like, um, and some peanut butter. So I always have that. And it's, it's a pretty big breakfast, but I always, I always make sure to have that base for the day. Um, as the day goes on, like my two rules of thumb is I never want to feel overly full and I never want to get to a point where I'm hungry. If I get to either of those two points, either I over eight or I get to the other point where I'm, if I actually get to a point of the day where I'm actually feeling pretty hungry, that just means I'm not keeping up with my calories. And, you know, a lot of people talk about like, Alex, you know, you also do a lot of cardio because sometimes I'll do an hour, even go to two hours of cardio and they're like, how do you maintain muscle? And I'm like, well, if I'm doing the cardio, like I'm eating, like I personally eat while I'm doing exercise all the time. I go to the gym. I have a rule with me and my athletes always have three snacks on you. So if you eat one, you still get a second and you get a third. Um, but while I'm doing cardio in the gym, working out, if I'm there 45 minutes or longer, I'm eating a bar and I kind of keep track of that while I'm training. Um, as opposed to not training, you know, I might have more snacks, a little more spread out, but those training days, I'm making sure like every 45 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever I'm doing, I'm just making sure I'm getting about like 300 calories at least in those time periods. Yeah. Does that, I'm, I'm just thinking through just kind of how maybe that plays into event day for you, uh, especially for these longer things, because sure. there's like this component where, you know, you're exercising for half a day and you have to consume stuff during that activity. You welcome potentially digestive issues. So does that, I think there's something to be said about having some of the products you plan on using on your goal event, at least in kind of the weeks leading up to it so that your body's a little bit more prepared to like kind of recognize that, or maybe to look at it from the other directions, like not introducing foods you've never eaten before the day you're trying to perform at your highest. Oh, hundred percent. Uh, so is that something you're kind of focusing on where it's like, these are the foods or the, the products I'm going to consume during this event. Do you dial up the quantity of those particular things leading in to sort of prepare your body for it? Or is it just uh, is that stuff kind of present enough in your day-to-day -day life that it's kind of just all, already there anyhow? I'd say yes and no. I mean, I, I train when I train, I eat food and those foods, I'll make sure those are things I can also eat while I'm competing. But like you said, when you're doing races, long endurance thing, your palate does change throughout that. And sometimes things become very unappealing. So I am going to eat a little more variety, um, during like a competition or a big event. But, you know, again, I train many days of the week. So I have variety throughout the days I train of what I eat too. Uh, but I do, it's like so important to 
train with the foods you're going to eat on race day. Like I've just seen so many people mess up. And then all of a sudden halfway through something, they're like running to the bathroom. Right. Um, the other thing too, is like CrossFitters know this. And when I got into really big into CrossFit, high interval training, like can throw your GI track for a spin, especially if you're not used to it. Like I know, like when I got going to a CrossFit, um, I originally went to CrossFit Invictus then CrossFit Southie. Like I'd be going in the morning. We do some like warming up, even just like the nerves. I'd be like, run to the bathroom after the warm. Up. Then I'd come back out. And then we'd do like high interval stuff and have to like run to the bathroom again until your body kind of gets used to it. So like some of that high interval stuff, if you're doing a lot of it and some of these more events coming out are more high interval, um, your, your body and stomach takes a little time to get used to and knowing how much food can you eat beforehand and during and what kind plays a huge role. Cause you do not want to be running to the bathroom midway through an event or like 10 minutes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. I mean, it's a, it's an issue in long endurance sport, as I'm sure, you know, I mean, you, you go to any triathlon, Ironman triathlon or marathon. And I mean, there's a reason there's hundreds of porter bodies lined up up there, <laughs> but yeah, and it's in, I mean, there's an individual component with like, you know, what kind of does your body is your body going to do? And like you mentioned, uh, you're, you've always kind of had a bit of an iron stomach. So for you getting past, uh, or, or perhaps that's maybe one of your strengths for these type of activities is you can kind of trust that you're going to be able to throw quite a bit at yourself. And I would imagine doing that in training is also maybe putting you in a position to be able to tolerate even more. So. Yeah, no, no, I definitely agree. And there's a lot of, um, I liked, and I personally like a little more things that are, uh, unprocessed. Like there are, there are foods out there. Like I can't do gels. For example, if mm -hmm. I do gels, like my stomach's going to be hurting at the end of an event and I just can't do gels. And that's fine. I've learned that, but I've learned it before I'm out there competing. Um, so yeah, I know it's definitely, definitely important. Yeah. It's, I always find that interesting talking to, to ultra marathon runners and just kind of getting a feel for like, what are they eating and drinking during an event? And, you know, there's always something that works like every time for one person, but is it a disaster for another? So there's some, yeah. there's some universal truths in terms of, uh, you know, fueling during sport, but then there's also the individual components where at, a, at the end of the day, you kind of have to figure out what, what's going to work for you and what's not. And, and, uh, if you do this stuff long enough, sometimes that changes. So <laughs> it can, can be a kind of a fun problem. To, well, fun is maybe not the right word for it, but it can be a problem to solve throughout the course of uh, some of this type of stuff. But, um, yeah. Alex, uh, let's see anything else that you want to chat about. Uh, I know you mentioned your, your upcoming event and some of the other stuff, but, uh, uh, anything else that, that you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, I was going to say two things. Um, one for this climbing event, um, this one quick note for like the mental health. So two things covering the mental health piece and also mentally training for this 24 hour climbing event. What I'm doing monthly in Boston is I'm doing a dawn to dusk walk. So right now it's like a 14 hour walk um, where I'm going out in Boston. We have a whole route and we're inviting people to come out and like exercise with us, talk about mental health, get a little sense of community. And I'm doing this on a monthly basis leading up to my event just to kind of keep my mind like ready to be moving for 14 hours or 16 hours or however long. Um, I was thinking about, I mean, you know, I could run for that long, but like that's going to take away from my training for the actual rock climbing. And I was like, you know, walking is very doable. It's a little monotonous but it's also going to help me mentally just kind of be in the mindset of doing something for a long period of time. Um, but yeah, so that's something I'm doing. And we also leading up from the previous event, uh, I created a, with my um, partner, Allison McCarthy, we created a non for profit called fitness for mental health, which is pretty awesome. And for our goal with that is we're looking to um, destigmatize mental illness we're looking to empower individuals dealing with mental health struggles along with their, along with empowering their supporters. And we're looking to educate people on holistic ways uh, to prevent mental illness. So understanding ways, things you can do to prevent that crisis from happening in the first place. Um, and we're actually getting these really awesome weighted vests made up where people can, you know, they have this cool graffiti art on them. And people can actually wear them during running races and it's different ways. It doesn't have to be a 20 pound. It can be like no pounds, it can be five, 10, 15, 20, but you can wear it during races. You can read it. You can wear it during long walks, other adventure sports or activities. And it's all there to support um, mental health and raise money. So we're kind of going that direction. I'm really excited about it. 
and the new events moving forward, all raising money for the not-for-profit too. So it's pretty exciting. That's really cool. No, thanks for sharing that. And for, for the listeners who want to follow along with your journey or check in with you, where can they kind of find you online, website, social media, and all that stuff? Yeah. So on Instagram, it's wish, W I S C H dot fit F I T. Um, that's the main place I post personal website is wish fit again, W I S C H F I T dot com. Um, and then for this mental health, we're building it right now. There's content up, but we're going to be building out more and more. It's fitness for mental health.org is this new non for profit we're creating and getting really excited about. Awesome. I will be sure to put all that stuff in the show note, folks. So if you want to go check out what Alex is up to, support the foundation or reach out to him for some of his services, those links will be be there for you waiting. Um, Alex, thanks a bunch for taking some time out of your day and uh, sharing your journey through depression, fitness, business, and everything that uh, made you who you are. I, it's been a pleasure being on your podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Awesome. Take care. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, if you are interested in adding some structure to your training program, I have some options that might interest you. Over on my website, ZachBitter.com, I have a wide range of ready-made plans that have options for beginners to advanced endurance athletes. I also have personalized plan options where I will cater a plan specific to the event you are preparing for and your personal schedule and training availability. You can also access a variety of add-on options from email collaboration to consultation calls to help guide you through your training and nutrition needs. You can access these with or without a formal plan. So head over to ZachBitter.com and let me know what you think. If you enjoy this podcast and wish to support either monetarily or by sharing, liking, and subscribing, please head over to zackbitter.com forward slash HPO for options, which include joining my Patreon page, making a quick one-time donation, which includes options to avoid the need of joining a third-party platform, or subscribing to HPO on your favorite podcast listening or viewing platform.